So as I have recently had the opportunity of working in Tom's group at the University of Cambridge. I was honored with presenting some of the many achievements he has had in his career. So Tom is an honorary director of research and emeritus Sir William Dunn Professor of Biochemistry in the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Cambridge. He has held positions at the Universities of London, Sussex and Oxford and was head of, school, of the School of Biological Sciences of the University of Cambridge between 2003 and 2009. Tom began his research career at Oxford, working with Dorothy Hodgkin on the first crystallographic structure of the insulin hormone. He has contributed to major advances in the fields of the structural and computational biology, receptor activation, signal transduction, and DNA repair, among many others. His group also developed a series of programs for modeling proteins and predicting the effects of mutations, which include the widely used modeler and fugue software. He has got approximately 650 published papers, including about 40 in nature and science, and has an age factor of 190. Tom has developed new approaches to structure-guided and fragment-based drug discovery and co-founded Astex Therapeutics in 1999, an oncology company that has been in 1999, an oncology company that has two approved drugs and several in clinical trials. He has also studied mycobacterial proteins as potential therapeutic targets with support of the Gates Hit TB program, American Leprosy Mission, and the Cystic Fibrosis Trust. Tom was member of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's Advisory Council on Science and Technology in 1988. He founded uh, the CEO of uh, Bio Biotechnology and, and Biological Sciences Research Council, the BBSRC. He was a chairman of the Royal Commission on Environment, deputy chair of the Institute of Cancer Research, and president of the UK Science Council from 2011 to 2016. To top all of that up, he has strong scientific research ties with Brazilian groups uh, with whom he has been collaborating for about 40 years, and he was elected corresponding member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences in 2016. So, without further ado, please welcome Sir Tom Blundell. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Pedro. It's a very great honor to be invited to join you in celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Carlos Chagas Biophysics Institute. Uh, many congratulations uh, to you. It's uh, particularly wonderful for me to be reminded of being in Rio uh, when I was elected uh, to your academy as a corresponding member, as you said, but also to uh, make contact uh, with Brazil, where I've had so many wonderful times. So I'm going to talk about structural biology, bioinformatics, and drug discovery. And I'm going to focus on targeting in drug discovery, cancer, mycobacterial infections for tuberculosis and uh, leprosy very briefly, and very even more briefly mention COVID-19. Uh, but I wanted to just say a few words with a few memories of um, Brazil. So I'm going to uh, do a little bit of history. So this is 1979, uh, and you can see Ivone Mascarenas, who uh, was visiting uh, London with her husband, uh, Sergio. And uh, in fact, Sergio was heading off uh, to Oxford, uh, but Ivone wanted to visit me where I was professor in uh, um, Birkbeck College. Sergio was a little bit reluctant at first, but he came to see us. And I think that year he never really got to Oxford. He spent all the time with us 
And so that was a, a wonderful time. You can see um, I had the hairstyle of the time. Uh, and um, you can also see that Ivani uh, looks very beautiful. So that was the start of my relationship uh, with her. Uh, Ivani came to the lab uh, for a sabbatical um, year and uh, worked in our laboratory. And when she left, she said uh, she would arrange for one of the brightest students they had in Brazil to come and work in my laboratory. So uh, this is what happened next. Glacius Oliver uh, came to join me as a PhD student. And uh, this is a few years later when he'd been in uh, Birkbeck College, that's part of London University, uh, for a year or two. And uh, you can see how young he looks. You can also see some other colleagues there. And um, I want to just focus on Richard Garrett, who's the uh, second from the right on the view. And uh, Glacius, uh, in, in fact, is in London here. And uh, Richard Garrett uh, was one of the colleagues. And as you will know, um, Richard Garrett was eventually um, encouraged to go back to um, with uh, Glacius, and he's been also been a professor in Brazil. So um, uh, Richard Garrett has played a role, and I'm very pleased to see them both contributing so much to Brazil. So these are some of the contributions from Glacius and from Richard. And uh, what I love about Brazil is not just the science and my friends, but I also like the music and I like traveling. So here you see this beautiful picture of some of the output of protein crystallography uh, in Brazil that I've been able to celebrate with Glaucius and Richard. So that's... Uh, the older background, but um, as you will know, Pedro, who's just introduced me, came to uh, join my laboratory uh, a, a little while ago, uh, two years ago, and uh, spent uh, some time with us and made some major contributions. I will say uh, a little bit about that uh, later in my talk. Another person who's joined me from Brazil a little bit before Pedro was Douglas Pires, who after he left my laboratory, I think a, a few years ago now, um, he went back to Brazil. Um, I visited him, but he found it very difficult uh, to manage. And he then moved to Australia, and I've met him there as well. So these are my most recent um, uh, contacts in Brazil, and it's uh, great to see Pedro, and I'm very honored that he's in, not only um, arranged with Francisco to invite me, but also uh, to um, um, introduce me. So let me get back to my talk. I'm uh, not a very focused person. Um, these days, I like to think that my science begins with genomes, both of human and, of course, in this case for my talk today, uh, mycobacteria. And, um, of course, when I started working in the 1960s, we didn't have any human genome information. We had a, a little bit about the proteome, about insulin, and over the following years, we've, of course, learned much about not only the human uh, genome and proteome, but also the mycobacterial ones. And I will talk a little bit about that uh, later in my talk. Now, of course, for uh, understanding uh, structure and function, and also for drug discovery, you need three-dimensional structures. And so uh, here is one of those that I've defined. 
um, and that is the protein structure of the largest kinase uh, looked at in three dimensions. This is uh, protein kinase uh, with 4,000 amino acids. I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, but this is a very good uh, target for drug discovery. And um, I'll also talk a little bit about how it's necessary to take these structures and organize the information. So we have a series of databases um, for cancer and for the mycobacteria. And the one uh, for tuberculosis uh, is called Chopin. Uh, when we did this, we thought that Chopin had died, the musician, of course, you know, um, and composer. Uh, we thought he died of tuberculosis. I think there's a little bit of debate about that now. He may have actually died of a, another mycobacterial infection. Um, but I will talk a little bit about how we built a proteome structure prediction system and a database. And we need to have sequences and structures of all of the, or as much as we can of the genome, so that we can choose targets if we're going to do drug discovery. And then it's sensible to collect information together about the way that small molecules bind to proteins. And so I'll talk a little bit about one of the databases we've set up, which is the Credo uh, Protein Ligand Database. And then, of course, we have to define the structure and with some ligands of uh, a drug candidate target. And for many of the targets, of course, they're available, but also many, especially in the mycobacteria, we have to start and define the structures um, before we can start the drug discovery. And I'll talk a little bit about the emergence of resistance. And we've studied that in our academic lab. And as uh, Pedro said, we've set up a company, Aztecs, uh, to do drug discovery using fragment-based methods. So my academic and my interest in companies have come together. And of course, the emergence of resistance has meant we've had to try to understand it. And I'll mention a little bit some work done um, with the very strong influence of Douglas Pires from Brazil on machine learning in order to understand uh, the impacts of mutations. So, that's the outline of my lecture and a little bit of an historical diversion that you've heard. But let me go back to a more um, uh, original uh, historical event uh, for me. And um, this is Dorothy Hodgkin and the top right-hand side here. She was, um, of course, known as... Uh, Dorothy Crowfoot at the time when she was around 32 or 33 when this picture was, uh, sorry, tw 22 or 23 when this picture was taken. And with her is the man called J.D. Bernal. And J.D. Bernal is the person who had the vision uh, when crystallography became possible. He had the vision to try and solve the structures of proteins and get uh, proteins crystallized. And Dorothy Hodgkin was very excited about him uh, and what he'd, uh, he'd achieved. So when Dorothy went uh, from Oxford to where I was when I worked with her to uh, Cambridge, where I am now, um, she uh, uh, was asked uh, to work on crystals of proteins. And uh, the problem was crystals like the ones you can see here, of, of uh, I think pepsin, um, are well defined even when she was doing this work with J.D. Bernal in the 1933, 34 period. 
But uh, when they put the crystals in an X-ray beam, they couldn't see any ordered protein. And Dorothy uh, wondered why. And of course, J.D. Bernal was a polymath and had interests in all sorts of areas. And he'd worked on water. And he knew that the structure of water is as important as the structure of protein to have a functional system. And so Bernal suggested that they should put the crystals in a tube, as you can see in this uh, slide, and put water on either side, and then seal the tube, and then the crystals would diffract. And sure enough, they did. And so this was 1934. It was the first diffraction of a protein. And um, Dorothy and Bernal were very excited. Bernal phoned up Nature, and um, within two weeks, the paper was published on the first diffraction pattern from a protein uh, structure and um, the preliminary experiments. And this statement that you've just seen come up on the screen is the statement that Bernal and Dorothy Hodgkin made um, to nature, and that was now that a crystalline protein has been made to give X-ray photographs, it's clear that we have the means of checking them by examining the structure of all crystalline proteins, arriving at a far more detailed conclusions about protein structure than previous physical or chemical methods were able to give. And so that was written in Nature in 1934. It took uh, another 20 years, though, the, to fulfill that vision. That was the correct vision, but the timescales were really long. And so Dorothy Hodgkin uh, started work on insulin in 1934, um, but she also worked on many other um, topics in, in the meantime. But the structure of insulin from the diffraction pattern wasn't really solved until 35 years uh, later, if I've got the sums right, 19, uh, well, nearly 35 years longer, uh, in 1969. And I was lucky to join Dorothy Hodgkin's group when that diffraction pattern had been available for 35 years, but the crystals were available and used uh, of insulin uh, to treat diabetes, um, but there have been no structure after all that many years of work. So I was very lucky to be involved in the analysis. And after two years, uh, after two years, well, after I joined, we managed to get the structure. And that was due to a lot of work over the many years. But my contribution was finding a new derivative um, of um, insulin, which allowed us to solve this beautiful structure up on the right-hand side. But it was the work of many people, as you can see from the authors below and the published paper in 1969. And um, this is the insulin hexamer on the top left-hand side, and this is the monomer. And of course, both are important. The insulin monomer is the biological form that binds to the receptor and activates the process of controlling blood sugar levels, as insulin does. But the zinc insulin hexama is absolutely important for storing the insulin in a safe way so that it's kept stable and making it available then when it's needed to release into the circulation. But of course, the crystals make sure that the insulin is released um, gently into the bloodstream over the next uh, 24 hours or so. So you have these releases, but the insulin has to last throughout the 24 hours. So here is my favorite picture. And um, 
this is a picture of Dorothy Hodgkin. And you can see that from the age of uh, early 30s uh, to um, 35 years later, uh, she is, um, obviously had a long-term vision and spent a lot of her life working on insulin. You can also see how beautiful uh, she was even 35 years later as well as when she started working on insulin. Uh, but I always like to show you this picture because you can see at that time I also had very long hair and maybe I was even beautiful, certainly more beautiful than now. But that's the, the background. And um, I went on um, to have other lessons from Dorothy. The, that one was how to define a structure. Uh, this is the team uh, of uh, Dorothy Hodgkin. So you have to have a long-term vision, but you also need a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we had um, physicists, chemists, biologists, and even medical doctors occasionally. It was international, and you can see we have uh, people from New Zealand, Australia, UK, China, and India. And um, you need so an international and an interdisciplinary team. And that's the model. So my second lesson from Dorothy Hodgkin was to keep uh, those criteria in my team. And um, it was quite unusual at that time. Most teams in Europe just had uh, English uh, people or Europeans and sometimes US, but very few this real um, multinational cast. This is a picture showing we had a nice time with Guy and Eleanor, who were the people leading the research on insulin when I joined in the 60s. And um, this is a picture of me with a low resolution model, but just the few days before we got the high resolution structure and I presented it after Dorothy gave an introduction uh, in 1969 at the 8th Congress of the International Union of Crystallography. It was a very exciting day for me. So many scientists um, in Dorothy's group were from around the world, uh, from India, as you can see, and uh, this uh, man, Vijayan, who had worked uh, with us on the insulin structure, became the president of the Indian National Academy. And uh, that's us traveling. And my other passion in life, um, or another passion in life, is really music. And I spent a lot of time not just doing science, but also learning to play the veena. This is um, a friend of mine, Krishna Raghavendra, who um, was a Veena teacher, and it, that was a great experience. So science is international, and you could also learn about the culture of other countries. And the same was true of China. So this is uh, my first visit to China, it was 42 years ago. I tried getting into China in 1972, but at that time, the regime had locked down. But um, we'd had a man called Liang Chong Chai, who um, uh, had come to work on insulin, and I wanted to go and visit him. And it wasn't until 1978 that with Dorothy Hodgkin that I managed to uh, go uh, to China. You can see me just sitting behind Dorothy Hodgkin and um, in discussion. So this is the team. You see Dorothy Hodgkin in the middle. You see on the left-hand side, Liang Chung Chai, who is the man who came and worked um, with us in uh, uh, Oxford. And you can see uh, Tang Yu Chi, who is the professor and main person in crystallography, um, had met us when we were in China, in Beijing, uh, 42 years ago. 
And then I had to give a lecture. Um, Dorothy wasn't too keen on giving lectures. And so for many occasions, um, including, as you can see, in the International Congress in uh, 69, I ended up giving talks. I'm very proud of this one because you can see that I'm uh, speaking. I have an interpreter there who is an amazing lady who was absolutely fluent in English, but most of the other people couldn't speak uh, English. And then above me was a picture of Mao, uh, the leader, of course. And then after the um, lecture, which was rather good because I had time to think in between each thing I said as it was translated into Chinese. I don't, of course, have to have an interpreter in China anymore. Everybody's good at English as they are in Brazil. Um, but afterwards, I had to um, perform in a different way. And here you see me playing the guitar for the Chinese. Um, uh, the guitar was the only instrument that I could play that I could find. I played the trumpet as my main instrument, um, but they made me play to them. And you can see they're in there. Many of them are in uh, their formal uh, Chinese uh, um, coats and things, which they were in the lab. So this was a very nice occasion for me. And it um, made sure for me that science was going to be international. So the other, uh, another lesson that I learned from Dorothy Hodgkin was that good science is done in industry and knowledge exchange is important. And so in the 1960s, uh, Dorothy was working on insulin and diabetes and because insulin was obtained from Novo, from Wellcome, and from Eli Lilly, all companies, I began to meet people, not just in academia, but in companies. And um, that was a good experience for me, because I was a very left-wing Marxist, and um, I got to know people in companies as well as people in um, politics. And um, that was very helpful. So when I left Oxford and I went eventually to Birkbeck College, I um, really thought I should do some things which would be useful, like um, insulin, of course, is used to treat diabetes. And I'd been working on pepsin and renin, which is for lowering blood pressure, and so I started to make contact with companies, and that was ICI, Zeneca, Pfizer, Park Davis, and many others, to see whether I could establish collaborative programs. And I put forward a paper in Nature um, with Lynn Sibanda, who's um, my um, wife now, and um, Lawrence Pearl, proposing that we could use the structure of proteins um, in a detailed way. In fact, I've been doing it already for a number of years, um, but this is a paper in Nature had a, a lot more impact. So what we did is we looked at the proteins that we had, and this is a pepsin family member, and um, I used it to deduce the structure of renin, which is involved in um, activating angiotensinogen. Um, and um, so this is a very good uh, drug target. And what I could see was that, as you can see on the left-hand side here, that the um, protein bound uh, a peptide, um, and that's what it did. It cleaved the protein, and I could define all the interactions of the peptide with the protein. The protein is on the right-hand side, and you can see there were not only hydrogen bond interactions, but pockets, and I could uh, aim at filling these pockets and um, imitating the hydrogen bonds of the natural ligand 
to design a new uh, drug. So that's our paper on um, the 3D structure specificity and catalytic mechanism of renin, which again was a paper that we use as a model for drug discovery, again in nature. But at that time, I was just looking at my structure that I had of pepsin and renin, and I looked at it carefully, and I suddenly realized, as you can see in this picture here, that on the left side and right side, the fold of the protein is very similar. And so in 1978, I predicted that that um, renin structure that we were using for drug discovery had an ancestor. <clears throat> and I predicted the ancestor would look like this. In So this was 1978. I predicted it was a dimer. And this uh, I was told off for. Max Prutz told me I shouldn't keep speculating and get down and do some structures. But I did structural experimental work every, every day. Uh, but in the weekends, I used to creep back into the labor laboratory and to the library and look to see whether this molecule that I predicted on the right-hand side, it's a dimer, which was, I propose, the ancestor of pepsin and renin, whether I could see it anywhere. Um, so I pr predicted it and published it in 1978. But in 1984, I, I found it. And it was in the genome of HIV, the AIDS uh, virus. And I suddenly realized that if it was there, uh, then I could predict its structure. I could define its experimental structure then pretty quickly as well. And I could then start fighting the HIV pandemic um, uh, with uh, new drugs. So this is a rather similar experience to we have with the coronavirus. We suddenly had the HIV and I was in a fantastically lucky position to be able to predict parts of the proteome and suggest how we move forward for drug discovery. So that protonase was coded within a sequence, and I could predict uh, that the HIV protein uh, would be uh, useful in cleaving the polyprotein, uh, which is coded by the virus of the genome. And that would then uh, mean that the target proteins would become active. And this could be controlled by the dimerization of the polyprotein as it assembled in the virus. And so I found a key to understanding the activation of the virus, but I'd also found a target protein. So I predicted the structure we didn't publish it immediately because I was under pressure to do experimental work. And it took me a few years before we actually got the structure uh, experimentally. But our prediction was correct. And already by this time, we were well on the way uh, to designing new ligands. And of course, eventually, and I um, may have influenced it, but it wasn't my work that there was a new uh, ligand found for that protease and that was used to treat uh, HIV but of course you then got resistance. So that story of HIV was really uh, a background story on which I based all my research um, uh, since then which was to do with drug discovery. So you can look at a paradigm for structure-guided drug discovery as going from the gene to the protein and exploring uh, biological space um, to find new targets. So we could take the, the genome and the proteome of either human, if it's cancer, for example, or a, um, a 
virus or a mycobacterium and we could predict the structures of the targets and we could in fact experimentally define them. And then the second stage we could uh, screen that structure to, with chemical libraries so uh, uh, get a new drug. So my idea of drug discovery um, in the 70s, uh, in the 80s rather, was uh, to define biological space, um, so to do genomics and proteomics, and then to define the chemical space doing some screening. And this is what we've done over the following years. The um, I'll give you an example of what we've done recently over the last um, 10 years or so on um, a very complex part of biology, and that is DNA repair. And um, this is non-homologous end joining, where we have three steps. The first step is, uh, in, in fact, the um, uh, bringing of the two ends of a broken double-strand DNA together. Um, and uh, that step one is followed then by a, a second step, which is end processing. And the end processing involves a big protein kinase, uh, DNA PK. And then the third step involves the ligation. So what I've set out to do over the last more than 10 years is to understand the complexes in synapsis, which is the first step, end processing and ligation. So i just show you how we've been doing that. Um, we've been uh, using lots of different techniques, small angle x-ray scattering, we've used computer modeling, uh, we've used x-ray uh, analysis, and um, that's the structure of the DNA PK that we published in Science. It took us seven years after getting the low resolution structure. That's the work of Lynn Sabanda and Dima Chikadze in my group. You could see them there on the left. And then, of course, there's been the revolution in cryo EM. And so over the last two or three years, we've been doing even more cryo EM than we were before and defining the structure at atomic resolution as well. And then we've done many other techniques uh, using nanospray mass spectrometry and others. So those are the techniques we need. Um, let me show you the X-ray structure. The X-ray structure of this huge enzyme with 4,128 amino acids was defined by labeling it with selenomethionine. And, but there were two molecules, so 8,000 amino acids in the asymmetric unit. Each of the molecules, we had uh, over 100 selenomethionines, and we first uh, defined the positions of those using uh, anomalous scattering to identify them. And we then used it to phase this huge protein and... Um, that you can see is just checking the cellular positions in the two um, proteins we defined independently. So that gave us a structure of um, DNA PK, and it took many years. The new revolution, uh, the resolution revolution in cryo EM has made things much quicker. So much later, in the last few years, we've um, been doing cryo-EM of DNA PKCS. We now have a, uh, we take those particles you see um, and put them in the Titan cryos. Um, we collected many micrographs and you auto pick particles and you can get a structure. The cryo-EM structure, as you know, we can do in a very short time. Um, just uh, a few weeks or months, although it does take a long time to characterize the protein quite often. Um, and uh, But the software is much quicker than uh, that for X-ray. So this is the resolution revolution, and I can compare the structure obtained in a short while by modern cryo-EM 
um, with the x-ray and uh, as expected they look pretty similar and so almost all my laboratory now is using cryo-EM and that's what's happened everywhere in the world. We have new structures and so we've got the structure of um, the complex of the DNA PK with Ku and DNA and um, that's uh, the three-dimensional structure of this huge great complex which we've just published earlier this year. Um, it's now at um, higher resolution than in that uh, picture but um, you can see we can follow the chain around and um, understand the structure and relate it to the function if we have the structure of very complex assemblies. So that's what's been happening. That's the excitement in the lab. Uh, you can see uh, that's the paper uh, that we published in 2020 as the whole complex. Uh, but there's been cryo-EM work going on at lower resolution um, and a higher resolution in China and elsewhere. So structural biology for us has become very focused on cryo-EM. Um, we can define structures and then we can look at the relationship between them. So this is the two structures in the crystal structure showing that the DNA PK is flexible, but we can also compare it with the DNA PK in the complex that I showed you just now with Ku and other proteins. So these are flexible molecules. We need to define the different conformers and understand the um, function uh, from st structure and dynamics. So the other thing we need to do is to actually look at the dynamics and we've use these single molecule analyses um, and you this is a method where you um, connect uh, your DNA because we're looking at the DNA repair system to a base and you can then watch over time the DNA ends being uh, joined. I haven't time to go through that but we published that also just a year or so ago um, in uh, nature, molecular and structural biology. But overall, we need to have lots of protein structures. So how do we get those of the human proteins and also the um, mycobacteria? And so what we've been doing in my laboratory is um, trying to extend the knowledge from the experimental side using uh, the prediction methods. So we've written... Oh, 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 oh. Sorry? Uh, and we've uh, using uh, assembly of the protein uh, fragments, satisfaction of spatial restraints, sequence structure and homology recognition. And these are softwares that we published, all of you can uh, use. And uh, we've used this then to predict the structures of the proteins in, for example, tuberculosis. And there's 4,000 gene products. We can predict the structures about 80%. We can do it for other mycobacteria. And this is one of the things that uh, Pedro has been working on when he was in our laboratory. This is mycobacterium obsessus structural proteome very much uh, the work of, uh, of Pedro and um, he's organized uh, it and also um, wrote most of the paper. And there you can see we'd improve methods and we could model 88% of the proteome. We've also done that for leprosy, for the mycobacterium leprae, which is very similar to that of um, tuberculosis. And so in the mycobacteria, we have three types of drug discovery going on for leprosy, uh, for tuberculosis, but also mycobacterium obsessus is involved in infections of cystic fibrosis. So this gives us a good background. We can make the databases 
And we've also just over the last uh, months been making similar databases for the SARS-CoV-2 3D. This is uh, what's in our database. It's all accessible in uh, our Cambridge site. You can see we've modeled oligomers, we predicted binding, we've analyzed mutations, and that's all in a paper that's under review at the moment. And um, these are the people who were involved in it. And again, you'll see that Pedro uh, was involved in this again. So we have a very useful analysis of the proteome of the COVID 2 3D. So we can bring out these databases now much more quickly. We have all the software set up, and I hope this will be useful in drug discovery and making uh, new uh, medicines against this terrible SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So that's what we've been doing uh, recently. And um, uh, we've also, of course, as I said, been doing the COSMIC database, which is the cancer gene census of the 700 genes where mutations occur. So we've modeled all of those and looked at the mutations. So that's getting the proteins, that's the biological space, and then we need to do the chemical screening. And the methods we've used there are the ones that we developed in Aztecs in the company. And you can see here we use very tiny fragments of drugs and soak them into crystals. Um, these fragments, we only need less than a thousand of them because they're very small, but we then have to elaborate them. So if you take small fragments, you can use very small libraries and you can do very quick and exhaustive screening and then you can expand those. And this is the method that uh, Haran Jyoti and I and Chris Abel, who is uh, also in Cambridge, uh, put together to found our company Aztecs. And Aztecs has used the fragment-based method. Um, we originally had th three people in my lab and Chris's lab, um, and Haran left Glaxo where he was. And then we got uh, a lot of funding, and we got 80 employees originally. Uh, we've now got 150. And um, I stayed as a non-executive member of the board, going up there very often. And Haram became the chief executive and has done a great job. So that's the building we have on the Cambridge Science Park. And we've taken um, many um, pipelines. Uh, we've um, got uh, a, a drug for advanced, advanced breast cancer using these fragment-based methods. And uh, in 2013, we actually sold the company for a huge amount of money, 886 million. But it is um, it is uh, capitalism, and the people who get the money are, are not the scientists. Um, but it was very good to get drugs onto the market as we've had them approved, and um, to show that we can be useful and uh, do things to help people's lives from our science. So that's the, the story of Aztecs. I'm still involved in it. We've got a second drug uh, 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 made. So we've also been working with neglected diseases. Um, we've got a program on tuberculosis, which, as you know, is a major problem in Africa, particularly South Africa. And um, uh, Bill Gates has been very much involved in Africa and um, very um, focused on funding uh, some uh, out-of-the-company drug discovery. And so he came to our lab um, now in around 2006 and encouraged us to work on this. And he was very pleased to find that I was connected with um, Africa. This is my wife, 
uh, Dr. Sabanda, Lady Sabanda, in fact. And uh, these are my two daughters. One's a lawyer and one's a doctor, medical doctor. And these are our grand nephew and niece. And these people are living in this wonderful country, Zimbabwe, but where there are terrible infections uh, from tuberculosis and, of course, um, AIDS as well. And so what we've done is to take the genome and proteome and use our techniques with a small team in academia doing thermal shift and SPR to do fragment screening and then taking the hits and elaborating those and making new uh, candidate drugs for tuberculosis. So this has been a very exciting period. We've got um, several molecules which are now nanomolar drugs, um, but the real problem is getting them onto the market. Again, it's a problem of capitalism. There are uh, not enough wealthy markets. Um, America um, and also Europe um, would be the place uh, but most of the people suffering from tuberculosis are from other parts of the world. And so it's been very difficult to get companies involved in this and to get them into useful places. But Bill Gates came to visit us. This is him arriving, putting on a lab coat, and, and there he's in a big discussion with us. And um, he's asking my student... Um, um, what um, he's doing. And then, uh, of course, we have to take the biophysics fragment base, do bioassays, and um, make sure they're going to work. So that's how we've uh, got uh, candidate drugs. We're increasingly using cryo-EM now um, in uh, of fragment-based methods. We can even see fragments uh, using cryo-EM and we've uh, uh, building a new cryo-EM facility in our company as well as having one in our laboratory in Cambridge, which has been introduced over the last two years. And of course, uh, we've been working on difficult um, targets in cancer. I'm going to have to run through this quickly. Um, this is um, the structure of the RAV51 BRCA2 complex, where we published a paper in Nature uh, showing there were some small pockets. And we've used a fragment-based method in the academic laboratory to look at interfacial. So this is interactions between globular proteins and the peptides uh, of other binders to identify binding sites and to target these. So this we've been doing in my academic lab, protein-protein interactions are not very uh, much followed yet in industry, but I believe they're going to be very useful in the long term. And this is just showing how we've used the fragment-based methods to get nanomolar ligands um, even in protein-protein interactions. And then just very quickly, we've been trying to understand the mutations and we've introduced uh, two types of methods for looking at mutations in uh, possible drug targets and uh, naturally also where they're causing disease. So one is a statistical method and um, this has been... Um, a multidisciplinary approach using a, a statistical potential energy function. And this is called SDM. And then a second method is by Douglas Pires. I introduced him earlier on, uh, a, a Brazilian who had this machine learning approach. And we developed the graph-based signatures and exploited a database uh, to um, predict uh, the effects of, of mutations in proteins on ligand binding using machine learning.
So this is what we've been doing recently. Uh, we can understand the effects of mutations, of course, if they're close as they are to a ligand here, but we can also predict when they're distant using our new software. And you have to realize that mutations that cause resistance are not just at the protein ligand interfaces. So that's the history of what we've been doing. Um, uh, we've been working um, to design drugs um, and now very much focusing on designing them to drug resistant strains. And we're looking at repurposing old drugs. We're even looking at fragmentation and regrowth of drug-like molecules and interfacial stabilizers. So that's my rather rushed history. And you can see that we do have uh, an international and interdisciplinary and gender balance uh, team. I'm very grateful to my partner, my wife, Lynn Sibanda, who's played a major role. You can see that she's not the only African there. We've got um, had Brazilians, here's Pedro, and um, we've had many people from many parts of the world. So that's the joy of doing science in an international and interdisciplinary and, of course, gender balance um, environment. We've had as many women as we could recruit. And so I hope that I've um, uh, communicated to you my excitement in using structural biology, bioinformatics in drug discovery, and in targeting not only cancer and mycobacterial infections, but also recently um, working in COVID-19. Thank you very much for listening to me. I've gone on a little long, but I hope that it's been clear. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Tom, for, for this exciting talk. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure we all learned a lot from it. And uh, for that, I thank you in the name of the Carlos Chagas Filio Biophysics Institute. Uh, I, I will now open the question section with a first question from uh, Professor Francisco Bastos, who, who asked, what is your perspective for the field of uh, structural biology for the next decades? What are the bottlenecks and challenges to be overcome? Well, I think the obvious answer to that is it's going to be... Um, using a, a lot of cryo-EM. Um, the, the exciting things that um, I've seen beginning to emerge are uh, a, that we can even see the fragments, um, as I described, using cryo-EM. Um, so you can see tiny molecules. People thought that X-ray would uh, continue to be important in uh, drug discovery. I think it will be. But if we can also see <coughs> even small fragments um, in cryo-EM, I think the future is going to be there. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, certainly in... Um, <coughs> And certainly in in the uh, coming years, that's where most people will be, I think. Um, but we're all, all always going to need the structures uh, of proteins with small ligands. And so I think that most of us will be building cryo-EM into our drug discovery companies. And that's certainly what we're doing. Okay. Okay. Uh... So, Professor Paolo Bisch, uh, he wants to know what are the challenges on, on cryo-EM and protein dynamics when, when you think about drug design? Yes, well, uh, there certainly are challenges. And I think one of the problems we always have when we have a new technique is we see exciting new developments and we think everything is going to be possible 
um, very quickly. Um, but um, I think it really does take quite a long time to get many of the methods um, uh, moving forward. Um, uh, just remind me uh, again exactly what the question was. It so he just wanted to know what were the challenges in cryoEM and protein yes. dynamics. When yes. Talk about dynamics. So uh, the problem I've had with uh, cryoEM, I think it's going to be a major problem, is that you tend to have a grid, and the grid um, you're trying to look at a complex. And you find there are uh, all sorts of particles over the grid. Um, in our case, with the DNA PK we put on the grid, we could see the DNA PK CS. We could see various complexes, and and so uh, I think in multi-protein assemblies, um, you're going to um, see them disassembling, and you're going to have to reassemble them, uh, but. What we really haven't done too much of yet is those reversible and dynamic uh, protein, multi-protein systems. So, for example, I've been talking today about systems that have multiple stages, like the DNA repair. And um, it's all very well to have a structure of the DNA PK CS, but we need to have the structure of the multi protein systems that are reversible and dynamic. And so this, I think, is going to be much more of a challenge. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, we've already got some complexes, but um, not the full complexes using cryo EM. Um, but I certainly think that that's going to be uh, a major challenge. But we will be able to see um, systems assembling. But I think the dynamics we're going to have to put together from the different insights we have. And that's going to be quite a challenge. So um, I think there are many things for people to do. And I think particularly in the multi-component uh, dynamic systems. Okay. So uh, I will uh, go for the next question, which is from Professor Claudia Laje. Uh, she asks how to fill the gap between the structural predictions and setting the more promising drugs for real life applications. Yes, well, that's uh, certainly a, a, a challenge. I've uh, certainly predict structures, uh, say, on mycobacterium tuberculosis. So I predict the whole proteome, as you could see from my talk. I do the same for the cancer targets, which are much more complex multi-protein assemblies. Um, but uh, I don't think the predictions of the models are going to be the whole story. So I use them to envisage the structure to see whether I think it's going to be druggable. And if there's no protein structure already there, I have a reasonable idea of what it's going to look like. But I still go in and do the experiments, uh, either using cryo-EM or x-ray. So I still think that the models of the proteins uh, may not be good enough to get really reliable predictions from uh, from fragment screening in the computer or docking and these other methods. I'm sure we'll all use them, but, but I'm also sure we need to check many of them uh, experimentally. But um, maybe the predictions and um, running the dynamics on the models we produce uh, will improve things. And certainly the methods have got much better. But So I still think there's some way to go there. Uh, so uh, thank you, Tom. Um, there are lots of compliments coming uh, both from, from here inside uh, Google Meet and from YouTube. So you have lots of uh, different compliments. 
uh, that are being um, shown here. And um, I think if there are no more questions, does, does anyone want to ask uh, questions, you know, in person using, using the, the system here, the presentation system? Okay, so um, I think with with that we can um, we can finish the talk and thank you very much, Tom, for agreeing to to be here with us today. And um, I really would like to to express how how glad we are to have had this opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Pedro, and to everyone else, um, Francisco. Um, I very grateful i hope to come in person next time i like being in real <laughs> <laughs> okay okay that's awesome thank you <laughs> thanks very much Sh should i sign out then now or you sign me out i think it's the easiest okay so yeah. i think i think the um, um uh, daniela will talk about a little bit just to finish the, the meeting and right. Yeah, so she's she's signaling me to actually close the meeting, and uh, I think with that we can actually uh, sign out. And uh, but thank you again. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tom, for your talk. And in Portuguese, I'm sorry. <laughs> é, na próxima semana nós continuaremos com o ciclo de seminários é, do, do Programa de Biologia Molecular Estrutural. Então, aguardo vocês todos na semana que vem, na quarta-feira, dia 21, nesse mesmo horário. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, I just go and show. Cheers. Thank you. I, I, I'll leave the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ah. Muito bom, Pedro. Muito bom. <laughs> Muito obrigado pela mediação e, enfim, por ajudar a acessar lá a apresentação dele. Correu tudo bem, foi ótimo, cara, muito bom. Obrigado. Foi muito legal, né? Foi, foi excelente, deu tudo certo. Sim, ele fez a sua história, foi muito legal mesmo. Parabéns. Muito inspirador, mas história bem fascinante. Valeu, cara, obrigado, tá bom? Obrigado, Obrigado, Dani. Francisco, e semana que vem a gente continua. Né? Isso. Eu continuo batendo bola com você para semana que vem, tá bom? Te passo as informações do, do, próximo, do próximo palestrante. Até sexta-feira eu estou te passando as informações, tá? Não, perfeito, que a gente está tentando divulgar ali no final de semana, alguma Não. coisa da semana seguinte, né? Para o pessoal poder se organizar, né? Assim. Sim, sim, sem problema. Eu já vou mandar o link para ele essa semana.